Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Project Reactor Lead Pivotal, Stefan Maldini, and Software Engineer Facebook, Steve Gurry. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around with us. I'm Stefan. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Steve Gurry. I'm a software engineer at Facebook. All right. So let's conclude this uh, morning session with um, a look at the future or a future for reactive architectures. And this is actually going to be precisely focusing on um, communications. And when I Googled uh, go, uh, an image for um, future of networking. That's what I got. It's pretty, pretty dope, I find. But let's get, before getting into the future, let's get a bit back uh, 44 years ago with Vinsaf and the invention of the transmission control protocol. So one thing um, we would like in, in TCP, it's um, Pretty, pretty flexible. We have these communications already uh, designed to do bidirectional um, communications. And in TCP world, we don't really have um, a well-defined um, role for who is actually a client, who is actually a server. It's more resonating, resonating in terms of who is a client, a sender, and who is a receiver. It's pretty symmetrical. So we don't have beyond the fact uh, of who is opening a port and who is connecting to the port. We don't have this separation of concerns um, very well defined in all the protocol. And the other thing we like in TCP is the flow control. And it, it kind of is very low level. So it's about you know, counting how many bytes you received and how many bytes you are, you are um, able to receive as well. And it's pretty small because it's basically a congestion avoiding uh, algorithm. And Today, the connected wall of today we have is, um, is what it is because of TCP. So it's pretty important to keep that in mind for the rest um, of this presentation. So moving forward a bit in time, um, going to uh, 1989, when um, a CERN team invented um, this HTTP protocol, very, um, very famous today. Um, everyone is uh, using it. Uh, I've seen this tweet from James Waters. 89% uh, of microservices architecture is uh, now based on HTTP uh, communications. It's really cool. When it first went out, um, it was all about serving documents. So we have this uh, requ request reply interaction. We ask for something. We get an information back. It's you know pretty pretty classic. Everyone did that in the 90s, and, and then you know we built even more and more use case uh, use cases on top of that. But that's basically how it, it you know it, it was uh, when it, it got out. It's really about um, serving things, serving documents, and it's fine. You know, it's it's doing that pretty well. The thing is um, today, how we really uh, doing the same kind of interactions we were doing in the 90s, even in the 2000 um, years. Maybe, you know, um, maybe not. We have iPhones uh, and Android phones. We, we do actually um, listen for, subscribe for notifications. So we don't necessarily request for something and get a reply, but we get multiple replies uh, at any time without all self-interacting with this device. We also we also use you know, smart watches when we run, when we do exercise. Uh, we interact with a backend server, giving all statistics and, and so on. We have this smart assistant uh, really interacting um, uh, in real time with a backend server, trying to decipher you know, my French accent, for instance, and asking the backend server, eh, what the hell is going on? I don't understand. Can you, you know, repeat the question? And you know, all these this interactions, um, interaction models, they are all part of what we could say a connect, what we could call a connected experience. They don't necessarily ask for something, get a response back, you know, disconnect it basically like that, and ask again for something. It's really, really more interactive. And if you think about HTTP, it wasn't really designed for that at first. We still keep using it for all these kind of interactions. 
uh, sometimes or most of the time. The thing is, maybe nothing is wrong with that. We can continue just doing so. Uh, after all, we have, been sp we have spent so many years uh, just using it. What happens when we do that then? Um, what other problem or limitation can we find in using HTTP? Let's take, for instance, you know, a few client, a few devices connecting to your nice uh, REST controller-based Spring application. And what could go wrong with that? In theory, you know, I mean, you've deployed production application already, but in theory, you know, normal case, everything is fine. We get, you know, this request going on to uh, the backend server. Then everything is fine until um, everything is not fine anymore. And what happens is, you know, maybe your backend application is um, actually having a massive garbage collection pose of the dev. Maybe it's just dead. Uh, maybe it's just a network glitch. He doesn't respond. We don't really care because it's all um, remote communication. We don't know why it's dead, but it doesn't respond anymore. So what the client does in this case, um, well, it does receive or not receive something. In fact, most of the time, it doesn't receive exactly a failure. It's going to behave you know, with um, multiple uh, timeouts, for instance. And basically, as a client, you have the responsibility of uh, building all contingency plans you can to deal with these problems. You, have, um, you place the onus on the client in, uh, in you know, dealing with this distributed systems problem. And that's the way it is today. And you know, um, it can be a client, a device client. It can be a microservice. It doesn't matter. It can be a proxy application. All of these uh, components have to actively deal with um, the HTTP you know, uh, kind of issues. So timeout, circuit breaker, all these smart things we have created to deal with uh, um, these uh, problems, they are all uh, the responsibility, in fact, of the client. So OK, that's fine. Maybe my application uh, is going to be uh, resilient enough and never fails because what I did, uh, I used the nice Spring Framework uh, 5 and Spring Boot 2. Now I can even update to 5.1. I used uh, the new um, dependency Project Reactor, and I create smart and very uh, efficient application. In fact, orders of magnitude efficient. Um, everyone is happy about that. You know, it's um, saving money. We, we run application with less memory and less CPUs. It's pretty cool. It's actually scaling super well for connection volume. Um, that's you know, one of the benefit side effects of reactive applications. Um, so yeah, what's wrong with that? If we, why do we need anything else if we create application with reactive um, um, libraries? The thing is, you can create the most beautiful application, the most efficient application you can as a you know, back-end application. If you, you know, like a race car getting into uh, LA kind of traffic, Los Angeles, uh, if you create a race car and go into the same uh, lanes uh, and commute to work in LA, um, your experience is still going to be the same in the end. You know, it's still this kind of um, uh, shitty experience. And the same problems are here. You still need to, um, as a client, to deal with all distributed system issues. So what if we could create, you know, this reactive application, this very efficient application, while being as flexible uh, as TCP protocol is. So as a reactive application, I can not only serve document, but I can you know, interact in real time with my smart connected smartwatches or, or mobile client. But still, you know, if I use something, a new uh, kind of protocol to do that, I want to keep it simple as HTTP because that's one of the benefits of HTTP. It's well-defined, um, sort of, and <laughs> it's also simple to use. Um, everyone knows how to use HTTP. So if we had something very you know, hyper-efficient by nature, if we have something designed for application communications, uh, not only for serving documents, and if you know, like reactive programming and reactive applications, if they were resilient by nature, um, so you don't necessarily need extra network layers or, or components uh, just because you, you have this responsibility of dealing with failures. What if we had something like that? And do we have something like that, Steve? I think so. Thank you, Stefan. So now that you understand about the past, let's talk about the future. The future is also get. So 
What is our socket? It's a layer, layer 7 application network protocol, so roughly speaking the same layer as, as HTTP. And you can use our socket as easily as with HTTP. You can establish our socket connection uh, easily between two endpoints. But unlike HTTP, our socket defined four interaction models for rich interaction. Those four interaction models are request void. You send a request and you don't expect a response. Request reply, when you send one request and receive one response, exactly like HTTP but more complex interaction model too, like request stream. When you send one request and you receive a stream of responses, you could use that for, uh, for instance, retrieving a list of responses or for implementing something like a subscription model. You also have very complex interaction model like stream stream or channel, where you send many requests and receive many responses without any particular order between those requests and response. Uh, by that, I mean you may send four requests and receive 10 responses. So our socket is efficient, too. And it uses the underlying network protocol to uh, transfer messages. But you don't, rely, you, you don't use as many connections as you have reactive socket stream. For instance, if you use TCP, you multiplex all those messages on the same TCP connection. It's very efficient. Also, it's transport agnostic. So basically, it works on a multitude of different transport. TCP is one of them, but also WebSocket, and even more esoteric protocol like Air on UDP. Our socket um, does not really impose any restriction regarding who is establishing the, the communication. So unlike HTTP, you don't have a client that can only send and a server that can only respond. You have two equal endpoints. And it's totally possible that a server in HTTP parlance asks something to the client, and the client will just reply to the server. It's bidirectional or full duplex. Like TCP, our socket has flow control. But unlike TCP, the flow control is at the message level. So when you send a message, you also specified how many responses you are able to satisfy. So in that case, I send a request to the, to the server, and I specify that I'm able to process two responses. Then the server must respect that constraint and only send me two responses. When I finish processing those responses, I may ask for more, obviously. So our socket works across the chain. So if you link multiple our socket connections, the flow control will work end to end. And it's also language agnostic. You may have a server written in Spring and a backend written in Node.js and another one written in C++. It's also agnostic regarding to the transport. So you may have a mobile client connected using WebSocket to your gateway, which is written in Spring. And that gateway is connected um, toward the backend with TCP on one side and UDP on the other side. You have no semantic loss. The flow control, the back pressure, everything still works. Here's the visual representation of the R socket stack. So you see that. Our socket is the blue line at the bottom. It works on top of different types of protocols, like TCP or WebSocket. It doesn't force you to uh, send specific format of message. You can send any type of message that you want. So it could be protobuf or JSON, text, or any custom binary that you may have. And you can use it in different styles. You could use the classical RPC style or a more advanced message-oriented uh, style. And we have implementation in uh, different programming languages. The three big ones are Java, JavaScript, and C++. So I have to give credits where it's due. Our socket has been the result of a long collaboration between different companies and numerous engineers. Uh, I have to thank Facebook, Netify, and Pivotal for contributing a lot of code to our socket. So that's about the theoretical part. What can we build on top of our socket? Here's an example of 
how we use it at Facebook. So I will use the example of a service called Live Server. Live Server uh, is responsible for responding to live query. And the live query could be seen as a GraphQL subscription. If you don't know GraphQL, it's basically uh, SQL on steroids. It's a very efficient and uh, powerful way of requesting data. So live query is basically a query, and the server reply with the data, but also a stream of future updates. I don't want to go too much into the detail, but the way it's implemented, the server watch all the data sources that you need for computing the response. And every time one of those sources is changing, you just recompute the response, and then you send the update to the client. So that's very powerful from the client point of view. <clears throat> but wait, there is more. Another cool feature of our socket is connection resumption. So if the application supports it, when you establish a R socket connection, you can specify the ID of the previous connection. And if the server still has the stream in memory, you may resume the consumption of your stream. So you, will, you, you won't need to reestablish the connection. You won't need to reestablish the streams. You just continue streaming the updates where you, 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 you stopped, basically. So for applications that have a rich interaction model, you often associate lots of state with the connection. And when the connection is drop it, dropping, you just need to uh, recompute that state. And that's pretty inefficient. With our socket, that state is stayed in memory. And a disconnection is actually uh, not a big deal. So unfortunately, I cannot really share any numbers. But I can tell you that there was a very significant running cost savings by migrating from a polling model toward um, something based on our socket when you have subscription. And the connection resumption was also a pretty big deal. Thanks, Steve. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. I think uh, you kind of understand why we have a certain interest now in exploring um, this protocol. We see a bright future for um, uh, such a, an efficient um, communication uh, layer. And it corresponds well to what we do right now with Reactor as well. So we are exploring a few things. I think if you really want to see it in action, that would be cool if um, you come by and stop by the next session. Uh, so at 11.30, I, I'm going to present with uh, CTO of Netify a pretty awesome use case of our socket, uh, Ballroom C. And at um, 2, uh, 2 o'clock, Ballroom C as well, Ben, Ale, and Rosen, Story and Chef, you just seen on stage are going to also present some um, pretty cool plans about the support of RSocket and Spring. And you know, I hope it's going to, um, to be um, um, something that you think about and you are getting curious and you, know, uh, you raise your interest. Because it's pretty disrupting. And you know, the first time I've seen that, I was like, wow, mind blown. I need to really understand what's going on. It's, it's pretty uh, amazing the possibilities you have with RSocket. So um, stop by. You know, interact with us, uh, ask questions, and come to the sessions. Have a great break now, and see you later. Thank you. <laughs>